we're going back to what we've been talking about, how to meditate. So I've summarized something for you. Um, seven steps to awakening, uh, Sata Bhajanka. Uh, uh, very important in meditation. We talk about that for two, three hours already. But it's very good to just to uh, regurgitate and review it. We said the first is introspection of attention. In other words, uh, actually introspection of attention. Why don't we say stabilization and introspection? Remember, re remember we will learn about how to stabilize the mind, calming the mind, and how to do introspection of the mind. So the first one is introspection of the at attention. The second, investigation and interpretation of subjective experiences by introspection with wisdom of the Dharma. So in other words, other than stabilizing your mind, calming down the mind, you also have to investigate and interpret with the right efforts, with the right understanding of the Buddha's teaching. So that means you have to have some right authentic concepts as taught by the Buddha and use those concepts to understand what is surrounding, what is surrounding you. For example, uh, impermanence, emptiness, or sufferings, or paticca samuppatta, the 12 links of dependent origination. All these concepts the Buddha taught us to apply these concepts to daily life so that we attain certain understanding of the meaning, the significance, and everything about life. So investigation and interpretation is very important. And then strengthening of the mano with the right efforts. So that means we, we really have to work hard in our spiritual development. It, it, you, you can't be lazy. You have to have diligence. You really have to work hard towards it. Uh, the Buddha worked very hard. In, in, in his path of purification. One, two, and three is, are the cultivation. And four, five, six, seven are more or less the, the results, uh, the realization. So contentment of our mano, so you are feeling content, pity, you have the body and mind relaxation. And then number six, mental equilibrium, you arrive at, at samadhi. A mental equilibrium, and then you enter into the jhana, upekka. You enter into jhana, the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, and then in practice you may get out from all these jhanas and get into a complete emancipation from the world of suffering, from samsara. So these are more or less the steps to awakening in summary form. And then we also mentioned the five meditation elements. And actually they're talking about the same thing. Inquiry, inference, contentment, comfort, and stillness of mind. Remember the five meditation elements? They are more or less the same thing. It's just expressed in a different way. Uh, so the uh, the, the, the Pali school, usually we talk about vichara, vittaka. When you have vichara, that means you are beginning to practice. You're beginning, beginning to understand the world. You're beginning to know that we have to get out from this. We have to free ourselves from samsara. So vichara. Then you have to draw conclusions and, and analyze, investigate, which is, which is vittaka. All these processes, you require them. In other words, you're using your mind to contemplate, to introspect, to practice, to meditate. You perform with all the vinaya, the five precepts. Abstain from killing, abstain from lying, abstain from sexual misconduct. All these, uh, the vinaya part, the morality part, the samadhi part, which is the concentration part, and also the introspection part, uh, which, which give rise to wisdom. So these actually more or less summarize everything 
in a general form. So that's what we've been talking about. For those who haven't been here for a long time, uh, you may have a tough time in understanding uh, the seven steps to awakening and the five meditation elements. But as you move on, you will understand more and more about it. And um, contentment, comfort, and stillness of mind. And, and then here on this part, body and mind relaxation, contentment, which is blissful, ha bliss, happy, and, and uh, mental equilibrium. But this seems to paint a good picture of meditation. This is the bright side of meditation. This is what you cultivate and what you can achieve, what you realize. But remember, if you have not done it properly, you may, go in, you may experience some dark side of meditation too. Don't think that, oh, if I do meditation, I'll be always be happy, content, uh, comfort, stillness of mind, everything will come out rosy, everything is rosy. This is an imperfect world. Whatever you're doing, there's always uh, the pros and cons of it. Given that you haven't done it the right way, it does not mean that this is marching forward towards the rosy garden and there, there will be no difficulties, no hurdles to overcome, no, nothing to overcome. You're just getting to the oasis, getting to the utopia of meditation. Meditation is not easy. It does not mean that once you meditate, you're getting to the utopia of meditation without difficulties, without hurdles that you have to overcome. And also remember, meditation is not a practice of just the Buddhists. The Roman Catholic, Christian, Jainism, Hindu, all, many religions have meditation too. And for example, in Roman Catholic, there are Roman Catholic monks who achieve mental equilibrium, just as the Buddhist monks have achieved mental equilibrium. Sometimes I've heard stories that you go to Europe, you go to the mountains, and, and there were Roman Catholic priests doing meditation in there, the, the, uh, the, the blissfully doing meditation. And, and of course, there are many hurdles that you have to overcome. And when, when they also mention in their books about the hurdles that they have to overcome. Uh, even in Hindu, in Hindu religion, in Jainism. And sometimes, they, it, for the yogi, sometimes they refer those hurdles that you have to overcome as Kundalini awakening. When you're going through Kundalini awakening, you really have to go through sufferings before you arrive at content and contentment and calm and mental equilibrium. If you didn't get the right teacher or the right way, you could come up with hurdles, uh, Kundalini syndromes. You may you may going through a cleaning process that is too, too um, overpowering for you. So you're going to watch out. You're going to do it the right way. All right? That's, we've been talking about meditation. The, so we know that it's stabilization, introspection, to classify into two parts. And in stabilization, we have counting, following, and stabilization. That, or calming, we have been talking about for many, many hours. Each one of these have two parts. The one is cultivation. The second is realization. In other words, how to cultivate counting. The Buddha told us how to cultivate counting, and as a consequence of cultivation, you come up to realization of counting. Cultivation of following, realization of following, cultivation of stabilization, and realization of stabilization. There's always a cultivation, which is the cost of it, and the realization, which is more or less the effect of it. And introspection, too. In introspection, we have the cultivation of introspection and the realization of introspection. Right now we're talking about turning and some people translate turning into, into returning or turning is the same thing. All right, let's go very quickly to as a review of last time because last time we started with returning. 
why do we have to return to the source of our um, meditation, of our stabilization and introspection? So we quickly review it. We say, okay, when we have the mind and we introspect turning, introspect, introspect with right under, clear and right understanding. Given that you introspect with clear and right understanding, but remember, not all people introspect with clear and right understanding. For example, in meditation, some people meditate with the wrong objective. They could have the, uh, the, the understanding that if I meditate well, then I'll be more intelligent. If I, I'm more intelligent, I can make more money. I can, I can be more healthy. I can look better. I can look handsome. I can look beautiful. I have good health. You know, they always meditate on the basis of acquiring more and more. I want to get more and more. They, they meditate with greediness, with acquiring. Meditation is to let go, not to acquire. I want this, I want that. I hope you know what I mean. So you really have to clear and right understanding. And when, you are the, when the mind is introspecting well, what are you introspecting with? You're introspecting with, you have certain objects that you introspect. These objects. So Satipatthana, Paticca Samapatta, the Buddhist teaching is the objects. So this is the subject and you have the object. And one of these objects, let's go back to what I, what I talked about just previously. These are the, all the objects. How do you do attention? How do you inquire? How do you investigate? What kind of experiences you have? The feelings that you have, feeling content. Oh, troubles come up. Mental afflictions come up. Jealousy come up. Depression comes up. All these things are the objects, the externalities to your mind, all these are externalities to your mind, not the, not the mind itself. And then returning means returning to the direction of the origin of introspection. Where does this mind arise? We are now examining the subject. We have been using the subject to examine, to investigate the objects. Now we're going back to investigate the subject. It's just like oh, going, getting back to current events. For example, the, the protests in Hong Kong, for example. All these things come out. All this, you know, uh, violence or whatever comes out. All these are the externalities, the objects that create it. Created by whom? Created by the subjects. What are the sub who are the subjects involved? The subjects, if we trace it back, is the thinking, right? And then we say, let us examine not just the protests, not just the people, not just the violence, not just the shooting, not just the, uh, the, the bloodshed. Let's get back to what causes this? What's the mind that caused all this? getting back to examine. People just examine the objects all the time. I hate this protest. It gives me inconvenience. I hate these people. I love these people. They're not getting back to the source. But right now, the Buddha said, returning now, we've been using the, sub I'll, I'll be on the subject to, we, we put through all these things, we arrive at certain conclusions, we have quiet, we have equilibrium of mind. Now, let's, that's returning to, where does this mind come from? One should return to the source of one's introspection so that one now introspects not only the concepts, not only the, the depression, not only the mental afflictions, but the very mind that is engaged in the introspection. The very mind, the very mind that engages in the introspection. Well, let's continue then. Then we'll get to the cultivation of returning. I've already gone into detail last time. I'm just reviewing. Since one introspects from the mind, one should now return to the direction of the origin of the mind to introspect the very mind that is engaged 
and introspection. What causes this? Where does this come from? The mind that engages in the introspection, from where does it arise? From where does it arise? I talk about it. You will have two probabilities. The one is it arises from a mind involved in introspection. Or it arises from a mind not involved in introspection. There are only two possibilities. This mind comes from a mind already involved in introspection. It develops into this. Or no, it's from a mind not, in, not involved in introspection. Only two possibilities, right? Either yes, it is from a mind involved in introspection, or no, it is not involved, involved in a mind in introspection. And then we say, okay, let's examine the first one. If it is from a mind involved in introspection, if this is true, there must have been a pre-existing introspection process already underway that, that now carries forward. But in this present situation, this is not the case, as there was not yet anything immediately preceding, counting, following, and stabilization that was identifiable with this introspection process. Remember, we have the stabilization, we have counting, following, and stabilization. If it is in, from a mind that's already involved in introspection, we should have something before counting, following, and stabilization, that is introspection. It's just like, how can there be a son without the development of a father? A father develops, gradually develops into a son. But in this case, there's no pre-existing introspection other than the introspection that is giving rise to it right now. So, it is not true. From a mind, it cannot be from a mind involved in introspection. Conclusion is, the introspection thought arose from a mind involved in introspection is not true. And then we say, how about the second probability? It arises from the mind, not involved in introspection. Uh, this possibility, we can see two other probabilities now. One probability is, is it the case that the, the mind not involved in introspection generated it when that non-introspection thought had already ceased? or is from a non-introspection thought that had not ceased. We're talking about logic now. And then we say, okay, now let's examine the first one. It arises from a non-introspection thought that had already ceased. But we say, if one maintains that it was generated by a Dharma which already ceased to exist, one should realize that if it ceased to exist, how can, if something already vanish, Logically, how can it come back again? Of course, the thought will come back, but I'm talking about the introspection thought. It already sees. If something sees, it cannot come back. And then we say, if it had not yet ceased, from this would be a case of two thoughts existing simultaneously, which is unapprehensible. How can something cease and something not cease? For example, a good and bad thought mixed together and coming together at the same time. Good is good, bad is bad. Right? Of course, the opinion is something good can be bad, something bad can be good. That's, that's not the logic. That's not what we're talking about now. When you're not using logic to talk about it. You cannot have two thoughts existing simultaneously, which is, then which thought dominates? There's no such thing as two thoughts existing simultaneously because you're contradicting the law of, the law of non-contradiction. A good thought and a, and a bad thought exist as one thought at the same time. They conflict each other. You are violating the law of non-contradiction. And we're not getting into details in this. We just re, uh, review it. If it is the, it, if it's the, that thought that has the characteristic of neither cease or not cease, it is all untrue, it violates the law of non-contradiction. And then, we said the conclusion is, the introspection thought arose from a mind not involved in introspection is not true. So it is not from a mind non-introspection thought that, that uh, had ceased, mm -hmm. And it's not right that it's from a mind and non introspection thought that it has not ceased. It both is not true. So we have a conclusion. 
The introspective mind was originally unproduced, unborn, uncaused, because it was unproduced, it does not exist. So, because it does not exist, it is empty, devoid of inherent existence. Because it is empty, there is no mind engaged in the process of introspection. It's not an entity, it's an activity. If there is no mind, how could there be any external object which serves as the object of introspection? If there is no mind, how can there be external objects? How can there be actual inherent existence of external object if there's no inherent existence of an entity that's called mind? So this vanishing of both the objective externality and the mind is the meditative process of returning to the source. This is the cultivation of returning. So the conclusion is, there's no such thing as the mind. You understand what I'm talking about? There's no such thing as mind. Now, if you don't understand this logical reasoning, well, let's get back to something very simple. What is this body make up of? What is, what, what is I make up of? I make up of the body and the mind, right? You are make up of the body and the mind. Let's put the body aside and talk about the mind. When we talk about the mind, we say the mind has a time concept. It's either a mind of thoughts, right? Thoughts is the past thoughts, the present thought, and the future thought. That's what the mind is. The mind is involved with the time concept. My mind, now, now my, mind, my thought comes up now. My thought came up yesterday. So there was a past, present, and the future in the mind, right? All those that happened in the past, they were not, you cannot bring them back again. So the past are gone. Can you bring back what happened in the past? Can you bring back yesterday's, what happened yesterday? Of course, you can repeat your thought. Yesterday I was angry, now I'm angry. You're just repeating a thought now. But yesterday's thought is gone. How can yesterday's thought gone be now? You can create another thought now, but yesterday the, in, the thought, is the inherent existence of that thought is gone. You cannot bring back yesterday. Yesterday is gone. So there's no such thing as yesterday, a time concept of yesterday, because it's gone. It's just a time dimension in your mind. And how about a future thought? The future thought has not come. How, come, how can there be a future thought? The future has not come yet. Can you bring the future into now? You always worry about the future only. You worry about the future but you cannot bring the future onto the present. And then you say, there must be a present. I'm existing now. I'm existing now. But you know that every thought, even every sentence you utter became a past. Every sentence you utter now became a past. There is actually no present. Because every minute now, when it happened, it became past. How can you grab on to the present? So there's no past, no present, and no future. There's no past thought, no present thought, and no future. Do you understand? So there's no such thing as my mind existing. How about a body? My body exists, right? But the existence of the body is a whole combination of all causes put together. Then I exist. The existence is existence on causality, on causes. And what is my body? My body is a whole bunch of molecules and elements. And if, when these elements, this org, org, system, this organs in me, this system, this breathing, everything work, it work. If, if then I stop my breath, I don't have any breath anymore, I collapse, I died. 
So the existence of this body is the existence of causality, of all the conditions put together, I exist. But I attach to it. I thought I have an existence, but actually I don't. I don't have existence. My body does not exist. My mind does not exist. It only exists on causality. That is exactly what this is talking about. We don't exist. There is no mind. And the Buddhas always point out to us that we're living in a dream of existence. We think we exist. We don't. We don't exist. But we hang on to existence. We grab onto existence. We never can get rid of the concept of existence. We think we exist. What is Buddha? What is the meaning of Buddha? Buddha is awakening from a dream, from a dream of existence. Oh, okay, now we've been talking about the cultivation of returning, right? How to cultivate returning. But right now, why don't we talk about the realization of returning? What do we realize in, re in, in this process of, of meditation? What do we realize? The vanishing of both the object and the mind is the essential characteristics of returning back to the source of the mind. Now the wisdom of the mind opens and develops. All efforts of introspection become spontaneous, unpremeditated, requiring no efforts. If you meditate in such a way that you return to the source of the mind and in true authenticity, in your true understanding, you know that there's no mind. There's no mind that exists. Because there's no mind exists. There's no external objects. If you really understand this, you come to a realization. Right now, you and me, if we haven't come to that realization, we only come to know the language of that realization, not the true understanding of it. We only, we only know the words of understanding. Because you really haven't practiced in such a way that you firmly know that there's, there's no mind. When we're talking about there's no body and no mind, oh yeah, logically yes, but then when you, when you practice, you have a body, you have a mind, you're attached to this body, you're attached to your mind. All your efforts in your introspection is spontaneous. All the concepts disappear. Concepts are objects, extern externality. You don't need those concepts anymore. You don't need Buddhism anymore. All these concepts, you don't need them anymore. But you need them because we're not at that level yet. You need them. But once you're at, you're at that level, all these all efforts of introspection becomes spontaneous. And you don't need to meditate on it. Right now, you need to think, this is empty. This is no self. Everything is impermanent. We're going through suffering. You need all these. But when you, are, when you get to understand, full understanding, the realization of returning, you don't need this. Because this, this, they, don't, they, they don't exist. You don't need them. Now, one should know that the dualistic thinking of objects in the mind and even its absence is a nuisance in the meditation. Then as you meditate more and more, and then you think, this returning to the source, there's no mind and no external object, concept, bothers me. I want to get rid of it. I want to let go of it. It's a nuisance to me in my meditation. This non-self, this, this uh, paticca samupatta, this sunyata, this emptiness, this impermanence, they bother me in my, in my equilibrium, quiet to a meditation. This become bothering me. I want to let that go too. Now, one should relinquish returning to the source and establish the mind in the path of purification. There's no such thing as returning now. Even returning is a nuisance. Even recognizing there is no mind, there is no object becomes a nuisance to you because mind and object is dualistic. Two extremes. We have external, we have internal, we have a mind, we have 
objects. These things become a nuisance to you in your meditation when you're at that returning level. But are you at that returning level? Sometimes meditation may have a minute of that. You may have a glimpse of that. But when you stop meditation, we go out to the world, you are as selfish as before, as temperamental as before, as emotional as before, because you haven't really come up to the true, true enlightenment. It has to be 24 seven, 24, yeah, 27, 20, 24 hours, 20, 24 hours per day, seven days per week in your returning, in your cultivation. Can you be like that? Probably not, because when you go to the cafeteria in another 15 minutes, you'll say, oh, this is really delicious. I love it. I hate this. I don't like this egg rolls. Is it egg roll? Oh, I, I like this. This is sour. This is sweet. Oh, it is extremely difficult to come to turning. It has to be a 24-7. But how can we be a 24-7? The Buddha can. There are Bodhisattvas who can. They always is non-self. They always have returning to the source. They always have maintained that, I don't know, that ekokata, that mental equilibrium. We call them the saints. We're not saints does not mean that we cannot be. They are saints in this world. They already have arrived at returning. They realize returning. We only know more or less the meaning of returning in a language form, but not in the Tathagata form. You know Tathagata form? not in the authentic form. So once you realize returning, then you start, to, you start to go into the path of purification. You start to get, you think that this absence is also a nuisance that you have to let go. We can't even let go our simple emotion of jealousy, hatred, greediness, love. We haven't even got rid of that. Not to say this returning. So we're talking about oasis. We're talking about utopia, but there are utopias that one can reach. We are living in an imperfect world, but there's perfection that we can reach. We call that nirvana. And this is the process of going there. And how much you can walk towards there depends on how much effort you put in. Some people work one lifetime, they work another, another lifetime, another lifetime, many thousands of lifetime, and uh, and then, 1,000, 2,600 years ago, there was a Bodhisattva who just had to work one more lifetime, and he became the Buddha, and that is Sakamuni Buddha. He was in Tushita heaven, waiting to be born to this world. He was actually born into this world as Siddhartha Gautama, and he became the Buddha. He worked his last life as a Bodhisattva. And we have a lot of work to do before we can do that. What level you are at? Are you at the counting level? Following level? Calming the mind completely level? Are you at the, um, um, what do you call, introspection high level? Maybe you're not, we're not at any level. We're in a level of greediness, hatred, jealousy, emotions. Maybe we're still at that level. But we already have developed because we already know the problems. It's good that we know all these problems. It's good that we know that we have to get away from this. 
A prisoner who was born in prison would never, would never realize freedom, the joy, the bliss of freedom. And then one day he was told, actually there was freedom outside. And he started to, to work towards it. And how much you can work, I don't know. So this is the realization of returning. Right now, you and me, we're at the level of using the mind to introspect with clear and right understanding. Given, we have to, given that we have the clear and right understanding, we have been using all these concepts to try to get into enlightenment. And if we can do that well, that is already a miracle. And, and then the Buddha said, then if you can do that well, you introspect the subject too. Introspect yourself, the, the mind too. How many people can really go back to the source to introspect one's mind? We can, but for how long? When we're meditating, we try to. When we've done something wrong that we want to repent, we want to think about it, maybe we get back to the mind, oh, I shouldn't have done this, oh, this is what causes it. You know, you're getting back to the mind. It's a whole process of, of practice. But knowing getting back to the mind is already a miracle for us to understand. Some people introspect everything with the wrong mind. They were involved in, in a lot of karma. Lying, stealing, all kinds of evil actions all kinds of um, unwholesome deeds, unwholesome thinking. They're not even standing on the ground of introspecting with clear and right understanding. Even, even we have learned it, sometimes we could divert into another track which could take us, take us into something unwholesome. Given that meditation to, can help us to let go, help us to arrive at mental equilibrium. The Buddha, 2,600 years ago, already, already know that the world is getting more and more complicated. We're getting more and more into involvement of unwholesome karmic energy. The Buddha introduced to us an easy method of practice in uh, one day without his disciple asking, maybe the, the disciples didn't even know that it's such a practice. And he said that there was another world that you can migrate to. You can apply for immigration over there. Then you, have to, you don't have to go through life and death anymore. It's very similar to the, to the heaven concept. So since everybody has to die, even if you are at, uh, even if you are arrived at arahatship in this life, you still have to you still have to get rid of this body to arrive at that arahatship state. So everybody has to die. So if you cannot achieve enlightenment in your meditation, which is very difficult, not easy, because you have to depend on your own on your own efforts to clean up the whole cleaning process. I just mentioned about the Kundalini Awakening. The Kundalini Awakening is a cleaning process. Cleaning up all your karma inside is tough. So the Buddha said there is uh, another world. Amitabha Buddha created a world for you to do your immigration. You will be reborn in there first. You don't have to go through some Zara reincarnation. And in there, you have to go to that school that you learn to get to enlightenment. So come to that. Amitabha Buddha said, come to my world. I'm welcoming you to come to my world after you passed out your life. And you come to learn in my school. You don't have to go through reincarnation anymore. Temporarily, you have to learn in that world, Amitabha world, 
Sukhavati Vyoha. Uh, Sut- Sukhavati Vyoha uh, laid out the details of that world. But there are conditions that you really have to fulfill these conditions to immigrate in there. These conditions are all laid out in sutras as to how to fulfill all these conditions so that at the juncture of death, you don't go into reincarnation anymore. You will be reborn in Amitabha's pure land. That seems to be the easy way to go for us. Even all the saints, most of the saints in ancient times said so. For example, um, Vasubandhu, Asanga, um, and Nagarjuna, all those are, are, are saints. They're arahats already. And they said, that's an easier way. You go there first, because given all the, the pressure and the tension that you have in this world, you, don't have, you cannot practice 24 hours per day. You can, only, you can only meditate for half an hour and one hour, and you, and you want to be a Buddha, just meditating for one hour and half an hour. So, reborn in this world, in that world. And I've been talking, I think one should really, if, if one practice Buddhism, one should have, take up the mission of telling people who are involved in meditation that it's not easy. We're not saying that you should not practice meditation. We just say it's not easy. Um, because you are depending on your own efforts to clean up all your karmic energy. In order that, you become an arahat, or you become a surapana, you become a sak- sak- sakadagamin or anagamin. How can, is it easy? Difficult. Even if, if, even if you have eliminated all your self mental afflictions, your ego, egoistic self afflictions, you become a Strodopana. If you have become a Strodopana in this life, doing meditation and, and, and eliminating most of the I mental afflictions, you still have to come back seven times into this world, karma world. But, but you won't get into the three vicious realms anymore. Hell, animal, and ghost. No more. But you still have to come back seven times. Every time when you come back, you improve. You, you improve in your meditation. After seven lives, you'll be the arahat. And if you, if you already arrive at um, Sacred the Garment, the, 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 then you come back one time to this common world, reborn one time. And if you're Anagaman, Anagaman, then you, come, you don't come back to this world again, you're on the Rupadattu world. This is too dirty for you. This common world is not clean for you. We just use the word dirty. It's not pure enough for you. You'll be reborn in there to practice until you become Arahat. So it's difficult. So the shortcut is to be born in Amitabha's world. And uh, there are sutras that we've been talking. And we plan to do more and more talking on the sutras and introduce the sutras to the Western world so that people know that meditation is not easy. But we cannot abandon meditation because meditation helps us to let go. You must meditate. But if you think that you can be successful in being an arahat in meditation, Extremely difficult, not impossible, extremely difficult.